All right, greetings, friends. My name is Weston Nakamura from Blockworks Macro in Tokyo. It is Friday, June 2nd, 2023, well after Asia markets close. And welcome to the Market Death Podcast, bringing you global market commentary and analysis from the Asia Pacific trading session so that you know what happened overnight. All right. What a way to end this week uh, on this Friday evening. So we have a big, broad based rally across asset classes, but mainly in equities during the Asia tra uh, trading session today. And it was led by Hong Kong with the Hang Seng Index closing about 4% higher on the day and pulling its way out of official bear market territory, which it just sank into just two days ago on Wednesday. Um, it was the Chinese mega cap tech shares with the large index weightings and influence that took the broader Hang Seng Index up. So this is like Alibaba, Baidu, Meituan, JD.com, Tencent. These were each up 6 to 7% um, on the day. And in basically in a massive and indiscriminate short cover scramble. Okay. And then just a few moments ago in after hours here in Asia, so after markets you know, had been had been closed, we got a headline out of Bloomberg saying that the Chinese government is considering a new batch of easing measures to support the property market. And now, as we speak, we're looking at additional upside in Hang Seng futures as well as in global equity indices. Um, after hours, Nikkei futures are now adding to its rally. Um, I'm also seeing over in Europe with cash equities just opening for trading, we have Euro stocks, FTSE 100, UK FTSE 100, IBEX, Spain, Italy, France, CAC 40 indices are all up over 1% as we speak. Um, commodities, you already know before I even tell you, but we have copper futures that are up, iron ore futures are up, steel futures that are up, um, crude is up as well, but that's, let's put that one aside given the OPEC plus uh, meeting coming up um, and the kind of pre-positioning flow that will be mixed in for a very noisy read. But NatGas is also rallying and doing so uh, as that China property easing headlines hit. Um, let's look at currencies as well. Stronger for the yuan, dollar yuan um, now plunging down clear through that 7.1 level that broke at you know market open on Wednesday when the Hang Seng Index had opened firmly into bear market territory. So now that those losses are erased on the on the yuan. Elsewhere in FX, we have the Aussie dollar up. Aussie yen is really up, well over one percent right now, um, as yen haven is getting sold to buy China commodity currencies. Other uh, major EM currencies are rallying. Lira aside, EM currencies are also on the move. Uh, Mexican peso, Brazilian real, South African rand. Uh, they are all strengthening. Um, as for major FX pairs, dollar yen, uh, the euro, the British pound, these are at the moment relatively flat, likely just awaiting the U.S. non-farm payrolls print out in a bit, at which point whatever whatever comes out um, and whatever the market reaction may be to whatever comes out out of uh, U.S. Uh, non-farm payrolls, we might actually see a delayed reaction to this China story that's blended into the U.S. state of price action. Okay. So... I basically had been working on a week in review for today's episode to follow up on what I had been discussing all week in real time with markets falling, um, which everyone was attributing to a weak China PMI print midweek. And I was attributing the month end index rebalancing flows for the you know market movement, particularly as it relates to a sudden stop in the upward momentum of you know utmost focus of late, the long Japan and long global AI tech themes. I had all the charts, I had data, I had everything prepared for today until this just hit. And so now I'm just ripping up that whole script to address this China property stimulus and subsequent current market activity instead. Let's talk about what Bloomberg is reporting on um, regarding China stimulus that just came out after Asia trading hours um, on a Friday night. Okay, And after a day in which the bear market had suddenly reversed and Chinese equities surged. Okay, and we're going to get to that point in a minute. Again, just to reiterate that point. The market rallied today, and then this news came out. Okay, so we're going to get into that. But first, here's just what the, the general setup is for Chinese developers, and also what Bloomberg is now reporting. Okay, so about two weeks ago, when dollar yuan broke through seven, 
I did an episode of Market Depth explaining the yuan, the importance of its price action as a barometer of the overall health and stance of the economy um, and policy, as well as expectations of policy, right? All of that kind of mixed in and embodied into the yuan, right? And how and why various other markets and assets correlate in price action with the yuan. Um, basically, that these various markets price action, say like the yuan and copper futures, which move in lockstep along with many, many other markets and assets out there globally that have nothing to, you know, that are not China, Chinese only markets, right? But the reason that these things correlate in price action to the yuan isn't because of capital flows between the yuan and copper or something that, you know, that w would correlate them together. Rather, like each each of these assets and markets are moving completely independently and coincidentally, but they are reacting to and reflecting the same root source, which is China. Okay. If you haven't seen it, it's the most watched episode of Market Depth thus far, and I suggest that you watch it. Um, it's from May 17th, so it's very recent. It's called The Chinese Yuan Plummets, What's Next? Um, and I'll leave a link in the description if I remember to. Um, but I want to reference a specific clip from that episode regarding the Yuan and the Chinese Property Sector Index. Okay, so just take a look. If you look, actually look at the Hang Seng Mainland Properties Index, sometimes it actually not only moves in lockstep with the yuan, but sometimes it can lead the yuan. It's, it has happened before. And you can see like this meltdown in the yuan is happening really in lockstep with the property index. And so I think that right now, of all of the problems on the table with China, it seems that problems in the property sector are re-emerging once again. And that is what is really pulling the yuan down and what pulled it through into the seven handle. I mean, yesterday, Hang Seng Mainland Properties Index was down like four and a half percent on the index. Um, I've actually looked at this index before for the yuan and I've compared it to the Aussie dollar or to certain commodities, iron ore futures and so on. And it does, it does actually lead um, sometimes, not always, but sometimes. Okay, so there are two things from that clip that I want to dive into. First is when I say that among all of the economic problems and headwinds that China is facing at the moment, and there are many, at least according to the yuan market price action signaling, but it seems that the most pressing ones of all the issues are those that are related to the property sector back in meltdown mode. And, well, here we are. We've been waiting for some form, any form of stimulus or support measures out of Beijing as markets and data are just like waiting and bleeding for the past, you know, m m several weeks, right? And finally, something comes, and it comes in the form of targeting the property sector. So, things indeed must be really bad if all the other various matters, all of which look like nightmares on their own, um, are the ones in a relative better stance at the moment versus the property sector. So, here's what's up, okay? First, this isn't just about saving the property market, okay? It's about getting to the root of what then spreads out to further issues and more kind of larger societal problems, okay? So in a very sort of oversimplified nutshell, this is basically what's going on, if you don't know, um, just to catch you up. Property developers in China are are a very integral part of the economic and socio-political like, backbone of China and its growth and its economy, okay? Property... And its subsectors, they account for about a quarter of China's GDP. It's not just like, you know, real estate agents or something, right? It's construction, it's furniture, it's like cleaning and maintenance services, and it's on and on and on. It, it spreads out like across so many subsectors, it's raw materials, and it's industrial production. So there's, so, there's so much that's tied to uh, the property and development sector, okay? So the way that it works is in China, Local governments in China are basically on their own when it comes to their respective like public finances, right? They don't get much support from the central government itself. So as an example, so even things like during COVID zero, okay? So that took a huge toll on local government finances because they all had to implement these measures by order of Beijing, right? Like lockdowns, whatever they are. But each local government had to pay for all of the procedures on their own. Things like the, you know, the nonstop COVID testing and the all the personnel to, to do that and whatnot, right? It's a very expensive, like, mandate. Either way, local governments 
are financially more or less on their own in order to you know to have to figure out a way to generate revenue um but they're also under specific guidelines of how they can generate revenue um and one thing that they cannot really do is like take kind of excessive balance sheet risk right so what they do is they set up what you may have heard of as lgfvs local government financing vehicles um, and they use these LGFVs because it sort of gives them the ability to do things off balance sheet, a loophole or whatever, if you want to call it that, even though the central government's clearly obviously aware of it. So what happens is local governments need revenue and they're sitting on a bunch of land. And then you have property developers like Levergrand. Property developers, they're in need of land to develop properties and housing on for which to sell. And then you have the end user, you know, the future homeowners, um, and they pay upfront, like down payments to the lever grands and, and whatnot for a, a slick condo or whatever it is uh, to be built in the near future, hopefully. Um, many of them are property flippers, but many of them are legitimate homeowners. Okay, so homeowners pay in advance to purchase property from developers like Levergrand. Levergrand then takes that money, issues debt as well, and they buy or lease land from the local governments. Um, via their LGFEs. And then they build property on said land. That building and kind of development process and all that kind of thing. That creates jobs, growth, and consumption. And that's why this has been like this kind of general process has been like the major driver, a major driver, if not the major domestic driver, the Chinese like miracle boom economy over the last two decades, right? It's not just based on being like the you know, low wage factory of the world. Like when you hear about this this concept of moving hundreds of millions out of, you know, abject poverty into middle class and all that, it's the property sector machine in motion that propelled that domestic growth in China. Okay. Now the problem is that the Levergrand and friends, the property developers, they're highly, highly leveraged and indebted. Um, which is all good as long as property prices kept rising. And they always do, right? No, no, obviously they don't they don't, right? Then about two to three years ago, Beijing got nervous about all of this, um, this excessive leverage in the property sector, and so they cracked down on it. And basically, they were they forced a very painful deleveraging process that was in, purposely intended to kill this like over leverage, too much debt using lever grand business model. And since then, the developers didn't have the money to finish properties that they had already started building and housing that they already took in like these significant amounts of down payments for from their customers, right? Uh, they also don't have money to pay their creditors um, or to pay the suppliers for services already provided, goods and services already provided, okay? And that means that the small business owner, the electrician or the painter, whoever, doesn't get paid for services already done or the family waiting for their property that's just frozen in construction limbo, okay? So this is like societal, it's not just like financial, but it's certainly financial as well, okay? And since that was happening, understandably, demand for property or the desire to put down, you know, 50% down payment on a condo or that they know that, you know, won't be built, that demand for property just dried up. And when that happens, that means that the property developers don't have any revenue stream, nor do they have the ability to borrow unless they want to pay like a 20 or 30 percent coupon to issue debt that they couldn't even service when their bonds are trading like at near par as it was. Nor do they have collateral as housing prices and the property prices fell on the lack of demand, right? And if the developers don't have incoming revenue, then they can't buy land from local governments. And then the local governments don't have revenue. And these LGFVs are like just these black boxes. Nobody knows what the, f the figures are really are, right? Like, estimates are that like the local government debt of these LGFVs debt outstanding is about half the size of China's GDP. So according to Bloomberg, Levergrand and Wanda Group and others, right? The amount of outstanding debt at risk of default is equivalent to 12% of GDP, okay? That's not total debt. That's just the debt at risk of near-term default. 12% of China's GDP. So what's needed is for home buyers' demand to come back to the market, right? Just to buy property and to give, 
you know, to provide developers an income stream again so that they can then provide local governments with their revenue stream. So that's the basic gist of it. Property sector problem is a very wide societal ticking time bomb. It's not just a financial stability and financial crisis matter, big as that is. And so earlier, according to Bloomberg, China is now going to take measures to support the sector. Now, what those measures are, I don't really actually know. Um, I don't know that they know either. But at least the government is apparently going to finally take some sort of supportive policy measure. Um, you know, like this is so they're saying, OK, lower mortgage rates for first time home buyers if newly constructed price uh, house prices drop for three consecutive months. Nationwide cap on real estate commissions to boost demand, pledging 200 billion yuan, 20 billion dollars in special loans to uh ensure stalled housing projects are delivered. There's also that some ideas discussed include reducing the down payment in some non-core neighborhoods of major cities, lowering agent commissions. Okay, I already said that, right? All right. Um, so the that none of those details really matter. What happened what's happening is that this has now set off this aftermarket rally um, in markets, particularly those that are you know, tied closely to China's infrastructure growth, right? So things from like raw materials to even like luxury goods um, in basically an assumed boost of consumer confidence. Um, and then even further, an assumption that Beijing is finally stepping in and maybe they will for other sectors as well and for other, you know, areas of um, economic concern um, with fresh stimulus, be it fiscal, monetary, regulatory, or whatever, whatever form may come, right? So look, the big question now is, is this now the turning point for markets globally driven by China on stimulus mode? Okay, in other words, how real and sustained is this stimulus, if at all? Is this just policy signaling or is this going to have real actual follow up? And if it's the latter, will it even work, even if it is a genuine effort by China to revive the sector and the economy as a whole? So, that brings me back to today's market price action, okay, as well as uh, the clip of the, you know, Yuan episode that I just showed you. And that point I made about how not only does the Yuan correlate with, highly with assets like copper futures and the Aussie dollar and all that, but that the Yuan is also very highly correlated with the property and development sector index, and that sometimes the property and development sector can even lead the Yuan in price action and thereby lead in price action of all the other correlated and associated markets. Because basically, if China's property machine is back up and running again, then the yuan, the barometer of China's economic health, goes up. And then as well as copper demand, as well as raw material imports from Australia and Aussie dollar, um, and various other things, other things that go up, right? So as I said today, we had a massive indiscriminate short covering on the mega cap Chinese tech giants that drove the, the Hang Seng Index up 4% on the day pulled it right out of its like two day stint in like the bear market holding cell. Um, and it's very strange because this rally, regardless of whether it's short covering or long buying, this happened during today's cash trading session. And the Bloomberg like leak exclusive report about this stimulus measure came out after market close. Right. So that kind of, that's very weird that for that kind of sudden, you know, 4% up day major reversal for really no reason to have occurred on the Hang Seng Index. And no, the Hang Seng Index does not care or and didn't move on Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer passing the debt ceiling bill that they just already passed in the House prior to. All of like the kind of media coverage or whatever is attributing the, the, uh, Hang, the Hang Seng rally to the Hang Seng Tech Index as a driver. And that's technically true, given the outsized weighting of the tech sector um, on the overall Hang Seng Index. You know, and as you can see, it has the the Hang Seng Tech Index had a five percent up day. So in that sense, I guess it did drive the rally um, during today's trading session. And also, you know, the tech sector is a completely unrelated sector to that which is being reported currently to be like you know under rescue in these after hours like kind of reports right so maybe the pre bloomberg report drop released rally was indeed just coincidental 
coincidental in sort of like timing, right? That it would just rally and then this report comes out after hours. But maybe it's absolutely not coincidental in timing. Because forgot the Hang Seng Mega Cap tech names short squeezing up 6% on, you know, a single stock basis. In terms of actual outperformance itself, you know what actually led the index higher today before this property sector rescue package came out? Surprise, surprise. The Hang Seng Mainland Property Sector Index, which closed the day up nearly 10% on the day. Nearly double the, you know, the like the single stocks of these mega cap tech, tech shares, right? As an index. For the single stocks within, we have names like China Resources Land is up 10%. Country Garden is up 13%. Long for Properties is up 17% on the day. Um, and if you're wondering, Levergrand shares three 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 Hong Kong have not been have have been on on halt since March of last year, and they don't they don't trade at the moment, I suppose. So that is the sector that really crushed it today, the property sector, and again it did so massively rallying almost double digits before this headline came out after market close about rescuing the property sector. And here is the yuan intraday price action that I've just put out on top but in red. And again, that's dollar CNH inverted so that when the red is basically going up, that's the yuan going up and vice versa. Okay. So this might now swing back into being odd again, right? Because it's not just the irrelevant to the announcement tech sector, but it's the Hang Seng property and development sector that rallied double digits on the day before the headline about this rescue package for the property and development sector coming out. But as I mentioned in the Yuan price action episode, the property sector has been the most problematic as of late, underperforming the Hang Seng tech sector by more than 10% in the last two weeks alone, right? It's, it's, getting, it's down 20% in just the, in the past like 10 trading days. You know, in fact, it had been getting hit hardest of all sectors. Um, and then also notice here, this yellow circle, which is yesterday, Thursday, when the index and the tech sector actually started to rebound upwards, right? You see that? See how the green and the white, those that are Hang Seng Index and Hang Seng Tech Index, they're starting to actually, like, you know, find bottom and start to rebound upwards, right? And again, that turning point, by the way, right at market open on a new month of June, or rather the accelerated sell-off that pushed into bear market territory, you know, just for a day, only to then bounce right out of bear market, uh, you know, the following market open, rather than continue further into bear market territory. That kind of behavior may very well be month and index rebalancing activities on a sector index full of the wi most widely owned and allocated to stocks in emerging markets, Alibaba, Tencent, Baidu, and so on. Okay, but that aside, also right here, right, when the Hang Seng Tech and the broader index begin their recovery bounce upwards, property development sector doesn't actually follow the rest of the index upwards and just diverges and falls instead. They're going in opposite directions at that point, right? And when they diverge directionally, notice once again that the yuan price action follows the the mainland properties um, index it doesn't follow the broader index up but rather it splits off and follows a property sector down what i'm showing here is that if the assumption for why the property sector rallied the most before the headline drop after market hours is because it's been getting killed the hardest and thus the reversal and short cover is thereby the most vicious when it's getting swept up in a broad-based index-wide indiscriminate rally, right? I mean, that's what I initially thought myself as an explanation as to why the sector rallied so hard and then we had the res sector rescue announcement afterwards. Um, that's what my initial thought was until I look closer at this chart. Because if that were to be the case, then the property sector's double-digit rally move would have happened or were at least would have started happening a day prior when the tech sector and the broader index began to bottom out and reverse upwards. But the sector, but the, the property sector seems to have actually have the ability to move independent of the broader index and move downwards. 
Okay, so on Thursday, despite some um, broader stabilization that's happening, the China property sector was still getting sold down. And today, major, major double digit outperforming rally. And then positive news of property sector policy support. So, you know, what am I, am I saying that there's like insider trading going on? Is that a, what I'm alluding to? Right. Um, and so, so what if there is, why am I harping on this? Okay. So first of all, let me just say that for, for the rest of this commentary, I really have no idea. Okay. I'm just presenting my very visible observations and then you can come up with your own theory. You could agree or disagree. I don't really care either way because it's all of it's just speculation all the same. So look, I don't know if this is like insider trading behavior or whatever. Okay. And by the way, when I say, when I'm using the term insider trading, okay, it's, I'm not saying it in some sort of like a negative accusatory way. Like I, I don't care, right? I'm using that term just to state objectively, like describing what the act is itself, right? That somebody or somebody's in a position of policy, or at least with knowledge of imminent policy, trading with that information ahead of it becoming public, okay? Personally, right? I don't give a shit if it is, if that's what's going on or not. I don't care. I'm not in that market. I'm not being victimized or whatever by it. Okay. I'm just being observational and trying to have some sort of takeaway or personal insight from it. Okay. And look, let's be very frank. Members of the United States Congress do the exact same thing. But the reason that it would matter if it is insider trading or not is because if it is, right, then it might actually help to understand if this policy that's you know subsequently been made public has any follow through legs behind it actual like follow through behind it right in other words a ccp official or group of officials who are tasked by the highest levels to carry out real decisive and long lasting policy efforts and measures to attempt to rescue genuinely rescue the property and development sector and thereby the broader economy, or at least attempt to, right? If said individuals or associates of these individuals with actual insider knowledge of the matter are also indeed acting upon it in the financial markets, then you know that it leans towards being more real in terms of government commitment and intent and even urgency, right? You know, if it's just the intended as like an empty signal for like just the time being or something, then you most likely wouldn't get insider market behavior, right? It's not worth the effort, if, if not the, the risk, okay? And risk as in, you know, risk of getting caught, as well as risk of it n not actually playing out in markets, like market risk, right? Um, as per Nancy Pelosi, take her for an example, right? Then Speaker Pelosi famously didn't bring a vote to the floor of the house unless she knew that she had the numbers to pass the vote and i'm sure that she also didn't put on a trade without using that same exact discipline sure things only right like 1000 batting average for both bills passed and trades executed she's not going to buy like a million dollars notional of in the money calls on like tesla or raytheon or whatever on like a 50-50 chance or even like a 90-10 chance or something, right? She's only going to put out, you know, her personal capital to work if and when she knows what's going to happen in the real world of policy and how much government firepower is behind it. And God bless her and her husband's broker. So that's what I'm saying here. If this is indeed insider trading in China, then this may be the start of a sustained policy commitment for the property sector. Conversely, it could also mean that's how bad things apparently are on the inside, so stay away, right? But either way, if there are signs of privileged info reflected in markets, um, that could potentially be critical to understand or to try to figure out what the, the actual insider intent at, at least the very least is right so back to this chart okay so this is the hang sang mainland, mainland properties index ticker is h s m p i now there are actually a few different sub indices um for the property property and development sector in china 
remember how I said property and development sector indices, um, and thereby the constituent stocks within the sector, can sometimes lead the yuan price action? Remember how I said that? Well, take a look at this. Now, this is a different one. This is ticker HSCAP. This is the Hang Seng China A Property Index. And if you look at this index and look at its price action, you'll notice that this index had actually bottomed and then began its upside move well before the yuan did, as well as before the, the other property indices, as well as the broader index. The Hang Seng China A Properties Index, this index had actually started its upside on the 30th at PM open, four days prior to all this. Okay, so this is a perfect real time example of what I mean when I say that sometimes these like subsector um, properties in indices can lead the yuan. Again, not always, not always the same degree or same manner, and not even always this particular one. Okay, I only noticed this after the fact just now as I was doing my looking around markets work for this episode. Um, and you can just look this up on your own and dive in further if you want. But here are the, just basically the two different property sector indices that I just showed you um, and their respective single stock constituents. Okay, And this first one, um, HSCAP, that's the one that I just showed you most recently, the, the one that moved early. Um, and HSMPI is the one I showed you first. So does this policy have legs? If I had to guess, I'd say yes, it does. Okay, because... I don't see who in the hell would be buying the China A shares property sector just as the Hang Seng is a, has been on its way down a straight line and is about to break into bear market territory earlier this week. Okay, and in such size that they were actually able to move the index upwards unless it was somebody who knew it was a sure thing. It might not even be like a real policy whatsoever, right? You know, this is a Bloomberg exclusive report citing unnamed sources. But that actually gives that insider info transmission thing even more credence. Like you're an official in a position of power and you're going to what? Anonymously whisper to the Western press for absolutely no personal gain and potentially only legal downside without taking any sort of market action? Come on. And if not you, then who in the hell would have punted on this market and went long. And again, in that kind of size, right? Okay. Now, with that said, just because I think that the policy has legs, that has nothing to do with whether or not I think that will it will actually work, nor how or if markets will respond to the policy intent or the policy implementation, okay? So completely separately, my market view is that if these Chinese policymakers are serious about this, okay, they have a lot of work to do in order to convince markets and convince their own citizens and businesses and basically the entire sort of community uh, to turn sentiment around, right? And then have it translate to actual activity and sustained activity. And that is a very long and arduous journey from current stance, and that will require far more firepower than in a, like an anonymous Bloomberg ex exclusive article. And so, for the time being, I'm happy to just sit and watch. And if anything, my personal trading bias is to actually look for one of these China proxy assets, X China, right? Be it copper futures, Aussie, and what have you, right? To get into an overly short squeezed uplift position to then open a downside directional trade in and play the fizzle out that would be if anything that would be how i'm looking at approaching the trade you know up to you however you want to decipher it if you want to just kind of throw it away as all nonsense that's perfectly fine with me that's very normal behavior <laughs> but um that i'm very much used to uh but it's an angle or at least it's a heads up that you should know about regarding what actually happened in markets before this actually took place, okay? That that part is not made up. You can just look them up on yourself. Like yourself, I didn't just draw these charts by hand. And then after that, I'll leave it to you to decide what you want to make of it, okay? That's it for now. I will definitely be following up on this as things develop, but give it a thought. 
Have a great weekend. Thank you for watching Market Depth. On behalf of Blockworks Macro, my name is Wes Nakamura, and we'll see you soon. Thanks. Bye.